Things Fall Apart, Chapter 2. Aconquo had just blown out the palm oil lamp and stretched himself on his bamboo bed when he heard the Ogone of the town crier piercing the still night air. Gome, 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 boomed the hollow metal. Then the crier gave his message and at the end of it beat his instrument again. And this was the message. Every man of Umwafia was asked to gather at the marketplace tomorrow morning. Akakwo wondered what was amiss, for he knew certainly that something was amiss. He had discerned a clear overtone of tragedy in the crier's voice, and even now he could still hear it as it grew dimmer and dimmer in the distance. The night was very quiet. It was always quiet except on moonlight nights. Darkness held a vague terror for these people, even the bravest among them. Children were warned not to whistle at night for fear of evil spirits. Dangerous animals became even more sinister and uncanny in the dark. A snake was never called by its name at night because it would hear. It was called a string. And so on this particular night, as the crier's voice was gradually swallowed up in the distance, silence returned to the world, a vibrant silence made more intense by the universal trill of a million, million forest insects. On a moonlit night, it would be different. The happy voices of children playing in open fields would then be heard, and perhaps those not so young would be playing in pairs in less open places, and old men and women would remember their youth. As the Igbo say, when the moon is shining, the cripple become hungry for a walk. But this particular night was dark and silent, and in all the nine villages of Mwafia, a town crier with his ogene asked every man to be present tomorrow morning. Aconqua on his bamboo bed tried to figure out the nature of the emergency war with a neighboring clan. That seemed the most likely reason. And he was not afraid of war. He was a man of action, a man of war. Unlike his father, he could stand the look of blood. In Umwafia's latest war, he was the first to bring home a human head. That was his fifth head. And he was not an old man yet. On great occasions, such as the funeral of a village celebrity, he drank his palm wine from his first human head. (laughs) In the morning, the marketplace was full. There must have been about 10,000 men there, all talking in low voices. At last, Ogbuefi Ezeugo stood up in the midst of them and bellowed four times, Umwafia Quenu, and on each occasion he faced a different direction and seemed to push the air with a clenched fist. And 10,000 men answered, Yah, each time. Then there was perfect silence. Ogbuefi Ezeugo was a powerful orator and was always chosen to speak on such occasions. He moved his hand over his white head and stroked his white beard. He then adjusted his cloth, which was passed under his right armpit and tied above his left shoulder. Umwafia Quenu, he bellowed a fifth time, and the crowd yelled in answer. And then suddenly, like one possessed, he shot out his left hand and pointed in the direction of Umbaino and said through gleaming white teeth firmly clenched, Those sons of wild animals have dared to murder a daughter of Umwafia. He threw his head down and gnashed his teeth and allowed a murmur of suppressed anger to sweep the crowd. When he began again, the anger on his face was gone, and in its place a sort of smile hovered, more terrible and more sinister than the anger. And in a clear, unemotional voice, he told Mwafia how their daughter had gone to market at Mbaino and had been killed. That woman, said Ezeugo, was the wife of Ogbuefi Udo and he pointed to a man who sat near him with a bowed head. The crowd then shouted with anger and thirst for blood. Many others spoke, and at the end, it was decided to follow the normal course of action. An ultimatum was immediately dispatched to Mbaino, asking them to choose between war on the one hand, and on the other, the offer of a young man and a virgin as compensation. Umwafia was feared by all its neighbors. It was powerful in war and in magic, and its priests and medicine men were feared in all the surrounding country. Its most potent war medicine was as old as the clan itself. Nobody knew how old, 
But on one point, there was general agreement the active principle in that medicine had been an old woman with one leg. In fact, the medicine itself was called Ogadi Nwayi, or old woman. It had its shrine in the center of Umuafia in a cleared spot. And if anybody was so foolhardy as to pass by the shrine after dusk, he was sure to see the old woman hopping about. And so the neighboring clans who naturally knew of these things feared a mafia and would not go to war against it without first trying a peaceful settlement. And in fairness to a mafia, it should be recorded that it never went to war unless its case was clear and just and was accepted as such by its oracle, the oracle of the hills and the caves. And there were indeed occasions when the oracle had forbidden a mafia to wage a war. If the clan had disobeyed the oracle, they would surely have been beaten because their dreaded Ogadi Nwayi would never fight what the Igbo called a uh, something of blame. But the war that now threatened was just war. A just war. Even the enemy clan knew that. And so when Okonkwo of Umwafi arrived at Umbaino as the proud and imperious emissary of war, he was treated with great honor and respect. And two days later, he returned home with a lad of 15 and a young virgin. The lad's name was Ikerne Funa, whose sad story is still told in Umwafi unto this day. The elders, or Indispie, met to hear of a report of a conqueror's mission. At the end, they decided, as everybody knew they would, that the young girl go to Ogbuefi Udo to replace his murdered wife. As for the boy, he belonged to the clan as a whole, and there was no hurry to decide his fate. A conqueror was therefore asked on behalf of the clan to look after him in the interim. And so for three years, Ekernefuna lived in a conqueror's household. Akankwo ruled his household with a heavy hand. His wives, especially the youngest, lived in perpetual fear of his fiery temper. And so did his little children. Perhaps down in his heart, Akankwo was not a cruel man, but his whole life was dominated by fear. The fear of failure and of weakness. It was deeper and more intimate than the fear of evil and capricious gods and of magic, the fear of the forest and of the forces of nature, malevolent, red in tooth and claw. Akankwo's fear was great, greater than these. It was not external, but lay deep within himself. It was the fear of himself, lest he should be found to resemble his father. Even as a little boy, he had resented his father's failure and weakness, and even now he still remembered how he had suffered when a playmate had told him that his father was Agbala. That was how Akankwo first came to know that Agbala was not only another name for a woman, it could also mean a man who had taken no title. And so Akankwo was ruled by one passion, to hate everything that his father Unoka had loved. One of those things was gentleness, and another was idleness. During the planting season, Akankwa worked daily on his farms from cock crow until the chickens went to roost. He was a very strong man and rarely felt fatigue, but his wives and young children were not as strong, and so they suffered. But they dared not complain openly. Akankwa's first son, Noye, was then 12 years old, but was already causing his father great anxiety for his incipient laziness. At any rate, that was how it looked to his father, and he sought to correct him. Constantly nagging and beating. And so Nwoye was developing into a sad-faced youth. Akankwo's prosperity was visible in his household. He had a large compound enclosed by a thick wall of red earth. His own hut, or obi, stood immediately behind the only gate in the red walls. Each of his three wives had her own hut, which together formed a half moon behind the obi. The barn was built against one end of the red walls, and long stacks of yam stood out prosperously in it. At the opposite end of the compound was a shed for the goats, and each wife built a small attachment to her hut for the hens. Near the barn was a small house, the medicine house, or shrine, where Akankwo kept the wooden symbols of his personal god and of his ancestral spirits. He worshipped them with sacrifices of kola nut, food, and palm wine, and offered prayers to them on behalf of himself, his three wives, and eight children. 
So when the daughter of Umwafia was killed in an imbaino, a Kemefuna came into a Konkwa's household. When a Konkwa brought him home that day, he called his most senior wife and handed him over to her. He belongs to the clan, he told her, so look after him. Is he staying long with us? she asked. Do what you are told, woman, a Konkwa thundered and stammered. When did you become one of the indicibie of Muafia? And so Nooye's mother took Ikernefuna to her hut and asked no more questions. As for the boy himself, he was terribly afraid. He could not understand what was happening to him or what he had done. How could he know that his father had taken a hand in killing a daughter of a mafia? All he knew was that a few men had arrived at their house, conversing with his father in low tones, and at the end, he had been taken out and handed over to a stranger. His mother had wept bitterly, and he had been too surprised to weep, and so the stranger had brought him and a girl a long, long way from home through lonely forest paths. He did not know who the girl was, and he never saw her again. That is the end of Things Fall Apart, Chapter 2. <laughs>